welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and Chris, and Chris has done something so mean to me today, so beyond mean, that I'm just going to let him fess up to what his meanness is. Chris, who have we got on? So, it's it's not really mean, but we have William Stuart Lindsay, who is a historian and member of, of the Nautical Research and the Navy Record Society, who specialises in Victorian maritime history. And he's here to talk to us about his first book, about the fascinating life of his great-great-grandfather, William Shaw Lindsay, a Victorian entrepreneur. So, yeah, basically, I've dragged Alina to Boaty Hell. <laughs> Welcome, William. Oh, my God. I <laughs> Let everybody laugh, please, because this will just make it so much easier for me. I said it would happen one day. William, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, first of all, many thanks for getting in touch in the first place. Just a quick background about the, the book and the, the history behind it. Uh, to my amazement, I was doing uh, some family tree research and discovered that my forefather in his day in the 1850s, owned one of the largest shipping companies in the UK. And I knew nothing of this. I also discovered that he wrote about 40 different journals or thereabouts uh, that were stored in the National Maritime Museum. And as a result, I uh, went there and it took me six years to transcribe them. And the the book is uh, the result of it. But much of the data is unpublished, so this is all new stuff. It's a really gripping read. I quite really enjoyed it. He's got a very good use, his use of language is fantastic. Just pull you along. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Writing a book is always different. Um, I, I had a couple of people who say, oh, why are you writing it in the first person? And a, as a result, it, it's more of an autobiography rather than a biography. And I had to decide, do I put it in the third person or the first person? I decided, right, I'm going to be true to his own words and sort of top and tail it with my own. Uh, but most of the book, 80 percent of the book is is actually uh, in his own words. And it was a case of pulling out the golden nugget nuggets in the uh, in, in his journals that I, I had to choose from, you know. Imagine you published all of those journals. I mean, you'd have how many volumes? Oh, I know. <laughs> well, there was a colleague who contacted me from Bristol saying, could I write the book uh, before I'd done it? And I said, yes, off, off you go. And he was going to do the life and times of uh, William Shaw Lindsay, which, I mean, it would take, you know, from 1815 to 1877 is a long time and a lot happened. And he still hasn't started really touch the scratch the surface really so uh i decided right i'm going to do it myself and and that's the result let's start with the first question let's talk about his early life and uh, why does he choose to go to sea yeah um he was born in 1815 as i say he was born in air in scotland and within sight of the sea he, he lived with his uncle um his parents were quite poor his father was a merchant and actually died uh, by the time uh, Lindsay was seven through drink. I mean, he he was uh, a merchant, a failed merchant. So uh, Lindsay's mother had to bring up four of them. Uh, She then moved to Gorbals in in Glasgow, took on some lodgers, but she then died uh, three years later. And as a result, uh, Lindsay went back to his uncle in Eyre and was educated briefly in Eyre Academy. and then uh, went back to Glasgow uh, t- to rely on his brother and sister, but they didn't really want him. And uh, as a result, he then ran away to sea. Um, and there's a whole episode of him going to Liverpool, living on the docks uh, for six weeks without much at all and uh, on the streets. And, and uh, finally, he tracked down a ship that would take him on 
uh, as an apprentice for four years. He went to, I mean, there's a, a, a lot of trips that he took uh, part in. He went to the West Indies. He nearly died of uh, yellow fever. Uh, and in fact, he woke up, he describes in his journal, waking up and uh, his, in his hammock and the two people on either side are dead through yellow fever. Uh, more than half the ship died of, of yellow fever. So uh, it was a, a, a difficult time. Uh, there was a, 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 the ship's mate was a bully um, and he had a, an awful time there. He had a lucky escape later on when um, he was asked by, or, or he took on uh, through, the, through the East India Company, uh, a consignment of um, treasure, actually. It was sort of gold and silver. And uh, he, he nearly got killed by a marauder who slashed him across the, uh, the, uh, the chest. And he shot the guy, but he, he ran away and didn't know whether he actually killed him or not. So there's a lot of uh near death experiences uh in the time at sea the the period that he's living in is is like possibly the last period of great adventure there's still not not all parts of the map are colored in yet and there's lots of or, like pirates running around and w wars all over scattered wars and different kingdoms so it's still um it's still an adventurous time to be alive running around the sea yeah i mean uh, it's interesting um it, it, I think people forget nowadays that uh, ships were like uh, cars <clears throat> in their day. There were no cars. There were very, well, no trains, no aeroplanes. So ships were the way of getting uh, goods across the world. And harbours were just like a forest of, uh, of ships in those days. And it's easy to forget all that. That was the main mode of, of moving things around. And one of the ships he was on was the Olive Branch. How, how did he find life on that? Uh, yeah, he, 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 he became captain of that. So within nine years, he'd become from uh, an apprentice to, to the captain. And he, uh, he found that very hard, particularly uh, sailing around the Cape of Good Hope. He, he, he describes how he had to stay awake for three days two nights uh, in, a, in a terrible storm, trying to make sure that the ship doesn't run aground. By this time, he's 25 years old. And I think um, in, the, in the Victorian days, um, people who did well there and applied themselves uh, did, did well at a young age, but it was really quite cutthroat in, in, in a survival way. What kind of business did he kind of run? What were his first business opportunities? Yeah, I mean, after nine years at sea, he owned a, a colliery in northeast England uh, near Hartlepool. One of the first things they did was to ask him to go and repair two ships, two vessels that, in Limerick. Uh, and uh, he went there and, and he learnt uh, quite a lot of the trade, how, how much to pay people, who to get in touch with to get the, the, the repairs done. So he learned the trade, which later on stood him in good stead. At Hartlepool, he saw uh, several shipwrecks, and as a result, he had a, a lighthouse uh, built there. Um, but what he was asked to do was to be a, a coal agent, sending uh, coal down to, to the south from northeast England. Um, and after a while, he moved to London to become a ship broker. And here was where he made his success. First of all, because of his experience at sea, a lot of ship brokers were financial, financial people rather than uh, sea people. So that his experience at sea meant that ship's captains came to him because he knew the trade. Um, so that stood him in good stead. The next thing is, and the big breakthrough, was that he started looking at coal for steamships, which were really coming on board by then. And so he went to P&O, got on very well with the, the managing director there, and um, as a result, uh, took on and assisted um, coaling stations for P&O around the world and providing them with, with that. So that by the, as I say, by the 19, by the 1850s, 
he'd owned uh, 22 ships, but he'd chartered 700 a year. So he he built up this massive enterprise basically from nothing. Uh, a lot of that actually came down to the fact that Crimean War had broken out. And so there was a large amount of ships that were being chartered by the French and the uh, Sardinians, for instance. Because, like, as you said, coal starts to become so important. And I have to say the word logistics, because ships, although still reliant on sail, may, as a back, it sort of becomes more of a backup. You'd need regular coaling stops around the world because it's uh, embarrassing if your ship runs out of coal and <laughs> you have to come in by sail and it can delay uh, uh, delay your transit. So it's it's actually he's actually been quite canny in his business choice. Yes, and the other thing about it is that there was a third way, if you like. There was either sail or there was steam. And a large, well, a, a growing number, Brunel and others, went into specific fully powered steamships. But Lindsay through, um, looked at a third way, which was providing a small engine for sailing ships to get them out of the doldrums. This was uh, based on his experience in, in sailing, and he found that a small motor getting him out of uh, difficulty in the doldrums, but also navigating through rivers and um, into harbours was very useful. Um, as it happened, within 10 years, uh, the steamships had improved uh, dramatically because of the engines had improved dramatically and were more efficient. But in, there was a period of about 10 years where this sort of third way of uh, auxiliary steamers, uh, as he called it, uh, was actually very useful. And that's where he sort of pioneered, you know. Absolutely. I could, I could easily jump down the rabbit hole of... Um... The Franklin Expeditions ships and even um, HMS Gannett, which was 1870s, having its backup engine. But I feel we'll, we'll lose Alina, so uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna move along. Um, and this was actually quite interesting. I'd never heard of uh, Caroline Chilson, but I had to look her up, and it was quite an interesting link. What effect did Caroline Chilson have on his business? Yeah, I mean, he met her by chance uh, in London, and. She was a heroine in, in Australia, and I, I don't know if you know, but there is a bank note with her uh, picture on it uh, in, in Australia. So she's she's heralded quite highly in, in, in Australia. She was British. Uh, she moved out to India and then to Australia, and she was a philanthropist. Um, the, in Australia, the gold rush meant that a lot of um, male uh, workers went out there and as a result there were le less women out there and she was determined to try and assist women going out to Australia and this is where Lindsay's ships came in useful and because of the companionship that they'd uh, built up um, he was only too keen to try and help that movement of women out to Australia. Politics not cup of tea but he did do a bit of dabbling in politics, didn't he? He certainly did, yes. Um, he was a liberal, a radical liberal. He wanted to make changes. And um, he tried for Parliament, first of all, in, uh, in Wales, South Wales, in Monmouthshire. Uh, there was a lot of corruption going on and people were being bought off uh, to, to vote for the, for, for the Tories down there. And so... He, he didn't get in. He then applied to uh, Dartmouth and was up against an admiral there. And there, again, intrigue going on and corruption, and he didn't get in. But the third time he won and he became MP for uh, Tynemouth. And he was determined to be uh, an MP in Parliament with a focus on shipping and navigation laws. So he was an advocate of free trade. Uh, he was a great friend of Cobden, of the Corn Laws fame, and uh, he was called upon by various different governments for his knowledge in, in, uh, in shipping. Um, I'll leave it there, but there are other things later on where he, politics really comes into the fore and he gets involved in, in, in a big way later on. Yeah, so we'll move on to something that rocked the century. It's the first war since the de in Europe since the uh, defeat of Napoleon, Crimean War. It's bigger than everyone thinks it is. What? How did it affect Lindsay? Well, four of his ships were chartered by 
the British to send out troops and, and uh, supplies out there. As I mentioned, he brokered uh, the French and uh, ships for the French and the Sardinian uh, navies uh, in a big way. Um, he built, had built a new ship in, in uh, Scotland on the Clyde called the Robert Lowe, the SS Robert Lowe. And <clears throat> he was actually quite ill for a while. And he came back when the, the, the ship was completed to find that the government had taken over the ship and removed the top deck, um, which absolutely infuriated him. Um, there's a long story behind it, but they didn't think that it was stable, so they took off the, the, the cabins at the, the, the top deck on, on the deck. Um, he learnt a big time that there was mismanagement going on in the Crimean War. Um, so, for instance, boots were being asked for by by um, by the, the 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 army, only to find that ships already had boots out there, um, and tables were being sent out without legs, for instance, and horses were in the wrong place, and in even part of the regiments uh, being called for were in the wrong place. They were in um, South Africa rather than here. So. Uh, his experience in the in the merchant navy, everything there was being recorded, because obviously um, it was uh, a financial outfit, and so you know there was an itinerary for everything. What went out was recorded. What came to port was recorded. All these uh, records were there, but that was missing in. Uh, in, in the Navy, and he had a real go at the, the Navy and the Admiralty about this. Uh, he was not popular. Um, and as a result, I come back to politics, he actually um, founded or was partly founded a, a new or, um, association, the Administrative Reform Association, where um, uh, certain colleagues got in touch, uh, MPs, um, and they were a movement. They're like they're a, a new party, uh, but the th there were three key members who were prom promoted by the government, so that the government uh, sidelined this reform association and overcame it by, by, I suppose, in a way, bribing three members uh, to to be promoted within the government. But that that's another story. Uh, essentially. He made a lot of money through the Crimean War, uh, through his own ships and through uh, ship brokers. Yeah, it's, um, uh, the Navy through history is always, well, the British military in general, the always poor organisation. But to have your troops rock up in South Africa instead of the Crimea is a bit of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we couldn't talk about the Victorian period and you, you mentioned Brunel already. But it's, there's a lot of nostalgia for the Great Eastern. Some people say it's one of the greatest steamships of the age. Other people are exceptionally critical. Where where does where does William come down on this? Because he's quite pragmatic. Well, because of his experience in uh, making money commercially through uh, merchant shipping, Brunel actually invited them on, on board while the Great Eastern was being built, and three of them went round the ship. So that was Brunel, Lindsay, and another guy called Stevenson of Rocket fame. And the three of them went round the ship, and at the end, Brunel said to Lindsay, "Okay, well, what do you think of it?" And Lindsay said, "Well, it's a magnificent piece of engineering." And Brunel said, "Well, I know that. I'm a, a master engineer. Will it pay for itself?" And Lindsay was a bit sheepish, and he was pressed, and he said, "Well, what I suggest you do is to dig out a bit of Brighton Beach, reverse the ship into it, where it'll be an attraction for Cockneys." And the, the the top deck will be a promenade, the middle deck will be a, um, a a dining area, and the lower deck will be a swimming pool. And Stevenson laughed his head off, but Brunel was not happy at all uh, and actually never spoke to him again. But actually, Brunel uh, died shortly after that, um, as, as we know. But actually, Lindsay was right, apart from the fact that the Great Eastern laid um, the cable across the Atlantic and uh, in, in uh, the East as well. Um, 
it was a commercial failure. It was so big that, you know, harbours couldn't accommodate it and passengers getting on board, that was a whole difficult thing. So it ended up in Liverpool with advertising boards and almost like a circus act. Yeah, a horrific money bit. Yeah. But, I mean, having said that, Lindsay had great uh, esteem for, for Brunel. And, and uh, you know, he was a man, as we all know, before his time. Absolutely. Yeah. Talking of men before their time, this one's a bit. This one's my own personal rabbit hole. I was going down, going through through the book, and I saw this name pop up, and I've mentioned it already. But William actually has something to do with the Franklin expedition, doesn't he? Not in the actually going on it or anything, but he do, he he does meet Lady Franklin. That's right. He met her about four times, and one of the times was actually in 1860 when he went out to uh, America and met her in Washington, there where she was obviously lobbying for, for uh, American help. But um, he helped her lobby in Parliament for funds for another search, uh, alongside Admiral Napier, who was actually a, a good friend of Lindsay. Napier was uh, quite prominent in, in the uh, Crimean War. Um, interestingly, we have in the records, uh, in his uh, journals, uh, two um, letters from Lady Franklin, and she does hint of underhand dealings of the government. I mean, obviously, she was driven to try and find her husband and what had happened to the ships, um, as uh, you, you would expect. But she did think that uh, there was something strange going on and, and implied that in letters to, to Lindsay. Yeah, because there was uh, the navy were a bit slow in their response, weren't they? Originally, they were sort of the, oh yeah, no, we'll give them another year. I'm sure they're fine. So, yeah, are they? <laughs> yeah. So we've touched on Chris's uh, millionth rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> because Chris has many rabbit holes when it comes to naval history and exploration and things like that. But there is another thing that William is involved in, and that's the American Civil War, because it has a massive impact on British maritime trade and shipping, and William. Yeah, indeed. And and this is actually quite tricky to get to grips with. Um, he had a large amount of trade going on it with the States, uh, shipping iron for, for railway out there and uh, importing grain and cotton. Um, and he had dealings with the North and South. But as I mentioned, he went out in 1860, just before the American Civil War, to the Northern States, uh, sort of advi well, advising um, the, the Americans on uh, navigation laws and trying to get some sort of uh, cohesiveness between uh, Britain and American uh uh, shipping with, with uh, navigation laws. And um, basically, he, he went round lecturing on this. And he went up to Chicago, for instance. He, he arrived in Boston, lectured there, went to New York, lectured there, then went up to, to Chicago. And uh, just outside Chicago, met a certain um, president-elect who was none other than Abraham Lincoln and had uh, dinner with him there. Um, then went back to Washington and then came, came back again. Uh, but he met uh, most of the Senate out there, including President Buchanan, who had aged dramatically uh, in, as his time in president, as president. But um, he came back here and supported Southern independence. And I think one of the reasons he did that was he was a bit of he was a pacifist and didn't want uh you know fighting between uh because it's essentially that the infighting in in the states happened even between families you know the north and south and he, he didn't want that but he also felt that the, the southerners were being hard done by they they were primarily um a agricultural country, whereas the North was more industrial, and the, industri the industrial side of it uh, had more representation, for instance, in, in um, 
in, in the Senate, and he was he felt that the Southerners were losing out. Um, so he was quite an, a big advocate. In fact, he he would be probably classed as the the main guy in Parliament uh, trying to support Southern independence. He visited Napoleon the Third to try and get the French on board, and he visited them him four times to try and get. Uh, as I say, the French and the British to to recognise southern independence. In the end, it didn't fall, it didn't work. But a, a lot of very interesting aspects going on that come out in the journals there. Yeah, a while back, um, the, the first uh, Boaty podcast I was allowed to do, <laughs> we, we I interviewed Alexander Rose about commerce raiders being built for the Confederate Navy in Liverpool. William has a bit of a role in this as well, or has something to say about them. Absolutely. And and um, he decided he wouldn't carry on in business because of the war. And he sold his uh, company to his partners. And actually, it was his partners who got in that, quite heavily involved in blockade uh, running uh, and had quite a few ships built, in, particularly in the Clyde. Um, as to whether Lindsay himself got in, in, involved in that, it's very difficult to pin down. I got a feeling that he was, uh, because of his background in, in shipping and design, uh, I think he probably advised. He, he knew, for instance, Captain Seams of the um, Alabama, which was one of the big raiders uh, and had tremendous um success as far as the Confederates were in sinking a lot of uh, uh, federal ships. Um, but he had met uh, Seams, Captain Seams, um, early on his visit to, to, uh, to Boston earlier on. Um, so he was involved in, or rather his, his, um, his partners were heavily involved in, in blockade running. And he was primarily focusing on the, the political side to try and get uh, recognition for the South there. Yeah, because it's a, it's a very dicey time for, for Britain because obviously the cotton trade is something that we're heavy, heavily quite reliant on. Uh, so we want to keep the South on board, but at the same time, we can't stir up the Americans. There's lots of underhand dealings going on and a lot of um, lobbying in Parliament. Absolutely, absolutely. And the Trent affair was a big thing. We nearly went to war because of it. The one of the uh, federal ships, the, the the United States ships, uh, took um, the two commissioners that were being sent out to represent the Confederates or the Southerners in in, uh, in the UK and in France, and they were held prisoner. And actually, when they were released, uh, Lindsay put up one of the families in his. In his manor at Shepperton, he bought a, a a manor house in Shepperton, so you could see he was involved in the movers and shakers uh, at the time. Yeah. So, um, how, how does the rest of his sort of political career play out? Because I'm, I'm going to get to his illness later, but in sort of post Civil War. Yeah, I mean, it, it, actually, his illness, which we will come to. The, the war hadn't ended uh, when when he was ill, um, and what he did was to turn to, primarily to two things. One was building houses in Shepperton. He had uh, he was a friend of Sir Joseph Paxton, um, and Paxton, of course, involved in in many things, but the Crystal Palace in in um, Hyde Park, for instance. And he asked uh, Paxton to draw up a plan like a garden city for Shepperton. And uh, that's one of the mysteries because um, that was lodged with uh, Sunbury Council, I think it was, and it's been lost. But there was a large map, a, a plan by Joseph Paxton drawn up for that, which is a shame that it's been lost. Um, but he built about six or so houses and tried to improve things in Shepperton. He also built a, a, a winter house uh, down in Bournemouth. Um, his wife um, wasn't well, uh, and so he found that going to the south coast uh, and the sea air was doing 
uh, her good. And um, then he also turned to writing. And this is where not only did he correspond with the newspapers of the day on various different subjects, but he wrote the history of merchant shipping in four volumes, which was a sort of a reference um, for, for a lot of shipping um, people in, in those days and was qu quite a successful publication. And, and it's still available today. Uh, it's already on my um, wish list. <laughs> yeah, and and the story of uh, Brunel is, is taken from in there. There actually, it's actually in 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 that book. So the, the, just to go go on, uh, his what actually happened was that he he had a stroke, and as a result of the stroke, uh, he was out of commission for a, at least a year. He had to resign as an MP. Um, but interestingly. But when he built his winter house down in uh, in Bournemouth, which is, by the way, is now a, a hotel, is it's a, quite a big uh, affair. But he had a a lift installed in that, uh, and he also had a a small steamer uh, on the Thames that had a, a sort of a hatch for a wheelchair to to go in. Um, so he was wheelchair bound. For the rest of his life, twelve years, and that's where he focused on his writing. So, but he covers quite a wide area of. It's not all nautical, uh, but it, he does do a lot of writing in those twelve years. Yes, indeed. Uh, not only novels, uh, but also um, various aspects, all to do with shipping, of course, and and his experience. Um, and he was quite successful in that. Uh, he. he uh, had articles published in in, in the, the papers and the Illustrated London News, for instance, which was big in those days. Um, so, yeah, it, he's, uh, I mean, w one thing I would say about all this is that um, when I came across it, I, I and the journals and his, his story per se, I had to decide, well, you know, is this worth exploring and and trying to, to to come up with a book? And I felt that I owed it to the old boy, giving some recognition. I mean, in in his day, he was actually quite well known, but he's largely forgotten now. And I, I felt that, you know, his exploits were worth recording and and giving him some recognition. Uh, and then as a result, um, not only have I done this book, but um, now I, I've uh, sort of fixed up 16 or so talks around Britain um, to, to try and uh, give some air to what his achievements were, specifically in places where he was involved. So in Hartlepool, down in Bournemouth, down in, in Dartmouth, and, and of course in London as well. Because uh, um, like you said, this is... I'd never heard of him, but it's such an interesting story and he's been involved in so much that I think, yeah, definitely the more people go, the better. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've some of them are, of the talks are for members only. So, for instance, there's a Crimean War Research Society that I'm involved with, and that's members uh, only. Um, what I'm trying to do is to try and get them to open up to the public as well, and I've been quite successful with that. Uh, with that. So... For instance, uh, on the 17th of July uh, in Hartlepool, the, the local history group, the Headland History Group, uh, are holding a meeting in the evening and I'm giving a talk there. Uh, on the 19th of July here in, in Letchworth, where I live, uh, David's Bookshop are, are putting on a, a, a talk uh, at seven o'clock. Um, you can actually get all these uh, meetings um, and details from, from my website, which is BillLindsayHistorian.com. So um, BillLindsayHistorian.com and, and all, the, all the talks are on there. Some of them you need to book because of numbers. Uh, and again, links to those bookings are, are on, on the website. That was really interesting. Not overly boaty. <laughs> which is good for me i and kept it of, light well, kept, yeah exactly kept it light and uh chris got got to get his socks off with a bit of naval boaty things and the franklin exposition because i know he's excited he's super excited he's like that's my question give it to me it's my question <laughs> and that's fine 
Uh, but yeah, it was very interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. And just remind our listeners the name of your book. Yeah, it, it's I, I managed to get a an advanced copy. So uh, it's William Shaw Lindsay, Victorian entrepreneur, and it's available on the fifteenth of July. So in a, in a month's time, it'll be in all good bookshops. Uh, and uh, there's a whole story of getting it published, but I won't go into that. <laughs> no worries. We'll get that into our bookshop. Uh, so Amazon don't get that massive cut. Joe. Whatever Chris rolls this line. Chris, you roll the line better than I do. Yeah, we'll get it into the History Hack bookshop as well. Uh, that way the podcast gets a small slice of the money. You get a larger slice of the amount of money than if it went to a river themed online bookshop that I'm not allowed to mention for legal reasons. And I don't have any money because my ex-wife still got it. So please don't sue me, Jeff Bezos. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result... We have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.